This week's episode is going to be a supplemental video to those of you that are currently taking one of my portrait drawing classes or would like to take one of my portrait drawing classes in the future. And if you are interested in taking a class with me, check out the description box down below where I have links to the classes that I will be teaching. That being said, I would like to invite you into the fundamentals of portrait drawing. Our journey begins with the outside shapes. So this is what we're going to refer to as the envelope or envelope, however you want to say. So I'm starting off with the outside shape. And remember that when you are creating a portrait drawing or any kind of drawing in particular, you want to work really, really light and hold the, whether it's graphite or charcoal, in this instance we're working with graphite, uh, from the furthest distance away from the paper. That is, notice how far back I'm holding the pencil. So as we work our way on the uh, drawing paper, you're seeing how we're starting to map out a very simplified shape for the outside shape of the, the head and the outside shape of the hair. And now we're going to work our outside shapes into our interior shapes. So with the interior shapes, we're now going to focus on the features of the face. So we're just going to make a very simple little angle here for the axes of the eyes. Now with the block in, I'm using an H graphite pencil. So I'm using a pencil that doesn't make as dark of a mark right away. So I can go in with simple straight lines and angles and very uh, carefully using comparative measurement figure out where all of these features are going to fit. So oftentimes when you're blocking in the features or when you're working uh, with the interior shapes you kind of want to relate them to the exterior shape. So I'm relating each one of these little angles. See how I'm making little angles um, or little indications of angles with the pencil. Just relating the shapes that I'm putting within the larger shapes and relating all of these shapes to one another is the way that we are approaching uh, achieving the correct proportions. So you just saw me use a little kneaded eraser. So that was a kneaded eraser um, to just kind of make some of the lines a little bit lighter. I don't necessarily want to completely erase any marks. Rather, I'm kind of moving along one uh, area at a time with the proportions. And just like you've seen in the, uh, the portrait painting demonstrations, I tend to prioritize the main triangle. And the main triangle, as you know, is the two eyes and the nose. Imagine each one of those features as a point in space, three points in space, connect them together, and you get a triangle. So that is what I'm focusing on at this point now with the interior shapes. So a little bit of terminology here, the outside shapes and the inside shapes that we're working on is all part of what is referred to as the block in. So blocking in, that is with simple straight lines and angles, making very, very light marks. We're trying to conjure up the likeness of the model just with a few simple marks. Now I'm going to keep saying the word simple a little too much in this episode, so I'm going to, I'm going to try to not say that word as much. Now, the important thing is to kind of know when to transition between two-dimensional thinking and three-dimensional thinking. Now if you're currently in uh, one of my portrait drawing classes, or you plan on taking one of my portrait drawing classes in the future, I'll elaborate much more on the difference between two-dimensional thinking and three-dimensional thinking when it comes to portrait drawing uh, and how that relates to painting. But to summarize uh, the differences in this short amount of time, I tend to always start off with a two-dimensional concept or a two-dimensional construct of the model to begin with, meaning I'm just optically uh, searching around with simple straight lines and angles. And then later on, you'll see when I'll transition into a more three-dimensional 
more conceptual type of mindset. Now with the angles, see how I'm dropping a vertical from the tear duct of the eye to the right all the way down. This is how I manage working through the proportions of the face. So the easiest thing to lock into on a practical level is the outside shape of the face. So that's why I start off with that. And then I built in, as you saw, the uh, the two eyes, the angle of the eyes, and the angle of the nose. Now using a vertical drop, I dropped a vertical from the tear duct to the right of the eye. It gave me the furthest distance that the nose needed to go to the right of the drawing paper. And now I'm going to kind of, in a sense, relate that point to how far down the nose needs to go. Basically all this means is that I locked in place the angle of the eyes first and now I'm using these measurements to figure out how far down the nose needs to go. And I'm still using comparative measurement meaning I'm not taking a caliper or anything and trying to perfectly uh, record the dimensions or sorry, the proportions of the features, rather, I'm trying to just work. I'd say this is a more organic way of approaching a drawing as opposed to tracing it or, you know, measuring it or putting down a grid. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that this, this translates much more to painting. I'm sorry, this translates much more uh, to painting. And in fact, I think I'm going to use this drawing uh, that we'll create in this episode and transfer it for a future painting. So you will most likely see this angle at some point again in the future. But as you can tell, uh, with the real-time footage, I am taking much more time with the placement. See how I was second-guessing that mark? So these are the kind of things that I wouldn't be able to do if I were to do this um, painting and talking at the same time, or drawing and talking at the same time. Uh, giving myself the uh, the ability to make a mark, say, make the nose too long or make the nose too short, uh, stand back and then second guess. So that's kind of a rhythm that you go when you're relating shapes. It's actually very difficult to talk about. Um, you make a mark, you stand back, you second guess it, then you edit it and it's kind of a cyclical motion if you've been drawing portraits or still life or cast drawings in particular if you've done cast drawing before you know the kind of uh, cyclical motion um, that I'm talking about so now using another vertical line I'm going to start to place the furthest distance to the left that the mouth is going to go so just very carefully now I'm kind of in a sense, putting down the kind of the coordinates of where the mouth is going to fit, but it's not that precise. Uh, it's just kind of gauging what the length of the philtrum is. So I'm thinking of what the exact length of the philtrum is relative to all of the surrounding shapes. Remember, if you're new to the channel, a philtrum is just the uh, the teardrop looking shape in between the top upper portion of your lip and the bottom middle portion of the bottom of your nose. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it is kind of difficult to see because I'm making the lines really light. Again, using an H pencil, so an H graphite pencil, and just trying to very lightly uh, guesstimate or approximate where all these shapes are going to go. And as I usually mention uh, with the painting videos, it's important to know how to manage your time. And this is especially true when you're working on a drawing. Now, one of the other reasons I'm uploading this, uh, this video in particular, focusing completely on drawing, is with, because with the past couple uh, painting demonstrations, I didn't really show too much of the drawing process and of course this video is going to be a supplement to uh, those of you that are in my portrait drawing classes currently 
or would like to take my portrait drawing classes. By the way, I'll have links in the description box down below to the schools where I'm currently um, or where I will be teaching uh, portrait drawing and portrait painting classes and other painting classes or drawing classes in the future. Now you see how we worked our way down to the chin and I actually ended up adjusting the proportion of the chin. So hopefully you can see the, the sequence. It started off with the big outside shape of the face. We went into the interior shape starting with the eyes and the angle of the eyes in particular. Then we went down to the nose, carefully looking at those points and those angles. And then we went down to the mouth. And now we've worked our way down to the chin. And so what you won't see in this, uh, this footage, just because it'll be way too long, is that I actually will repeat that process and adjust the outside shape of the face, just trying to get the contours as um, not perfect to the photograph, but as um, naturalistic as possible. Now, there's going to be a little a difficult thing to talk about in terms of realism and how to not make it photorealism. Now, there's nothing wrong with photorealism. I'm going to keep this little dialogue very brief. Uh, but the goal here is not to perfectly replicate the photograph, even when I'm working in contours. I'm not trying to perfectly replicate the photograph. Rather, I'm trying to interpret the visual information in front of me and create a drawing. And that type of interpretive process is what creates our own individual and unique styles. So that's all I'm going to say about that. That can be a very long conversation. But now back to the process of the drawing. So as you're seeing, I'm actually repeating that process. As I mentioned, I went back up to the angle of the eyes, in particular the eyebrow. There I am using a vertical line again. There I am adjusting the outside shape, constantly second guessing and standing back. And it's very important to be able to you know, give yourself the patience, <laughs> the patience, give yourself the time to practice uh, this type of uh, cyclical motion. If that's even the right term, I apologize if I messed up my English yet again. But it is a process that is repetitive in nature. It does repeat itself, the process, but it is coherent and solid enough that you can go through this process and even though it may take you about two hours, five hours even to get your linear block in and check, maybe the next time you do this kind of uh, drawing, you might be able to do it in say two hours and then again and again and again, you will just get faster at seeing these shapes and relating these shapes and seeing these spatial relationships. Now as I usually do, I'm going to now slow down the rate of the narration just so I don't fill up the video with too much talk and too much talk in particular at the same uh, words per minute kind of pace. And we're still in the same stage. So you're seeing footage of the exact same stage. All right, now time for the shadows and accents. So this is now going to be a transition into the structures of the face. And as we're transitioning into uh, so-called structures of the face, we are now going to shift into three-dimensional thinking. For those of you that are in my portrait drawing class, again, link in the description below uh, or my other classes. I'm going to do this in my painting class as well. 
I'm going to do individualized conceptual drawings in class to explain the structures of the face a little bit more clearly. It's kind of difficult to do that uh, with a video, uh, so it just makes more sense to do that with a live model as I'm going to have uh, a live model in my portrait drawing and portrait painting classes, but allow me to explain it the best that I can. So as I said, we're doing shadows and accents now at this point. So we're going to start to introduce what I call accents, which are the dark half tones within the light area of the face just as light approaches shadow, because we all know the difference between light and shadow. One is in light, the other is in shadow. Accents are a little bit more difficult to identify. Um, so each time I put in some type of shadow or some type of um, dark shape and the light, it is to tell where the form is turning most away from the light. And what you're seeing right now is just putting in a wash of value using the H pencil for the iris and for the um, the shape surrounding the upper eyelid. With graphite, I do prefer uh, to layer lighter and then progressively make it darker as I go, very similar to how I would layer an oil painting. And in particular, uh, graphite I think is much easier uh, in terms of the handling of the material to achieve this type of uh, specificity in the drawing. So now switching to three-dimensional thinking, see how I'm making that um, little dark half tone on the side of the eye socket. I'm conceptualizing how light is turning on the side of the eye socket. I also have to consider the angle of the light. Now this lighting is a little bit more difficult because this lighting is referred to as frontal lighting. So frontal lighting is when the light is pretty much right in front of your model or a still life object or whatever you're working on. So the shadows are quite minimized. That is, the shadow doesn't really take up that much of the real estate on the portrait. So that means that the accents or the half tones are going to have to be very well studied. See how I'm starting to put in a very, very light uh, wash of tone to the side of the nose, but putting more pressure into the areas that are turning furthest away from the nose. And in particular, right below the structure of the orbicularis oculi, so the orbicularis oculi, the muscle uh, muscles for the areas surrounding the eyes, trying to create the curvature of the structure around the eyes. Again, this is all very conceptual in nature as we're considering what these structures look like in three dimensions. And now we're putting a little wash of value on the lips. That's another nice thing about graphite is that it doesn't smudge everywhere just like um, like you it would with charcoal. As I'm filling in this uh, shadow value for the side of the lips. I'm also uh, gradating the tone as the dark of the lips gets closer and closer to the shadow. This is most easily attained, uh, at least in my opinion, with a very, very sharp pencil as opposed to, um, you know, like using a stump or um, you know, blending the graphite with the light areas of the face. I actually prefer to, for the most part, work additively. As you're seeing, we're starting to add darker and darker values. But you'll see a very um, interesting trick that I'm going to use to put in the darker areas around the face without having to work as much for those darker valleys, but I'll, I'll show you what I mean when we get to that point. Now I'm starting to work down the bottom of the lower lip as we work our way towards the bottom of the um, orbicularis oris, transitioning right to the side 
of the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone. Again, I'm conceptualizing uh, the darkest accents or the darkest halftones in the light. And with graphite, it's really nice to go in for those dark accents first because you can always layer over top of those um, accents that you've made and still maintain the integrity of the tone that you've placed. See how I'm starting to put in a little bit of a darker tone underneath of the, uh, the mandible. So now that we have all of these accents established and all of these darker tones established, I'm going to work again in a cyclical process or a uh, kind of a repetitive process going right back into the eyes, uh, putting more emphasis in the dark tones surrounding the concavity of the eye socket, the side of the eye socket, the upper eyelid. There I'm putting in a mark for the philtrum. But I'm going to be working, again, in cycles, making the values uh, even more precise. Now we're putting a little light wash on the top of the forehead. And when I say wash, I don't mean like um, I don't mean like a pen and ink wash. I just mean a very very light application of tone. And now the next step is going to be one that you would want to take with extreme caution. So I'm using graphite powder and Viva brand paper towel, and I'm very cautiously filling in a darker tone around the light of the face covering the background and the hair and this is going to lead us into our next stage which is building the darks so we're going to be constantly building the darks in order to turn form so just like we did with the accents that i was describing earlier see how i'm working in the same exact spot starting in the same exact spot that is the um iris of the eye and the pupil of the eye. Uh, note that I am switching pencils now. I pretty much have all of them, I think. That should be the 6B pencil. So I'm now alternating between the H, uh, the the B. So it could be HB or, or 2B, it doesn't matter. So again, going between H, HB or 2B. 6B and then 8B pencils. Now I'm going to be going from one area to another. This is also referred to, uh, sometimes referred to as a window shading, where you choose a little window of form, you choose the boundary of that given form, and then you start to apply uh, values such as this one right here in order to get the the dimension or the depth of the form to turn. Now this is still pretty much a, uh, I would consider this three-dimensional thinking, but you can also compare these values two-dimensionally in a sense, um, just trying to blur your eyes between the model and the drawing. As you're seeing, we've spent a lot of time already with the darks building those darker tones all the way up to the light of the paper. And with the drawing, it depends on how far you want to go with the values, but I typically don't want to make the lights as dark in order to push the highlights. I usually don't prefer to do that. I prefer to build the tones just until we reach the highlight and sometimes I'll cover the entire light with say the H pencil and then I'll go and subtract the highlight with a kneaded eraser but I am very cautious in, at how uh, how dark I make the lights on the face because once you make a very dark mark within the light areas of the face, in particular with graphite. But this can also be the case with charcoal too. It's very difficult to get back to the original tone of the paper. And 
and see how we're rolling the form over the side of the cheekbone. This is very similar to glazing with oil paint where you're putting in just a, th a thin application of your, uh, in this case, your drawing medium. See that? So we put in the thin application of the drawing medium and then we have the added ability of subtracting. And I can even do that in many, many times, going in with the dark and then subtracting more light, constantly making the forms more and more specific. And now I'm going to slow down the rate of narration for this episode once again. And again, I'm just going to slow it down so I don't repeat myself too much or fill up the video with too much talk. So as you're seeing there, I'm very lightly shading a light washes of value, imperceptible value changes that turn as the form very, very slightly goes away from the light. And this is very similar to how you would glaze very subtle, imperceptible half tones with oil painting. It's, it handles very similarly to that type of aspect. The only difference between the glazing with oil painting and the uh, layering like we're doing with the graphite is that you can't really subtract the graphite, but with oil paint you can subtract the glaze while the painting is still wet. And this turning of the form is something that is very unique, in my opinion, to graphite in that you can create a very, very dimensional uh, image with a compressed value range just with the, uh, the subtlety of the transitions of tones that you can achieve with graphite. See how the dark light, um, the half tone, just as light transitions into shadow, uh, beneath the mandible is extremely smooth now at this point and again I didn't stump I didn't use the stump in the light side of the face or any kind of blending tools on the light side of the face instead I prefer to work as I mentioned before additively with a sharp pencil at this point this pencil uh, is a HB or 2B pencil that we're using to push the values a little bit darker. But I do transition between the H and the HB depending on how dark I want to transition to be. And as I probably should have mentioned before, uh, as I do mention in each one of the episodes, always take note that the camera is at an angle with respect to the drawing. So it will distort the um, picture a little bit. Um, 
but just know that the camera is at an angle with respect to the drawing as you can compare the proportions of the uh, the finished drawing to what you're seeing here it's a little bit different but in any case if you didn't know the camera is at an angle Alright, now returning to the regular rate of narration, now you're seeing the, uh, the bottom part of the, uh, the clothing that the model is wearing. With uh, drawings in particular, I usually don't emphasize the, uh, the clothing or the drapery as much, so just a few little lines should suffice with that. And this uh, thing you're seeing there is a block of graphite. That's a block of 8B graphite. Uh, it hasn't been sharpened, uh, but it's just kind of a big clunky block, <laughs> so to speak, of uh, graphite. I find that these blocks of graphite helps a lot when you're trying to cover an area very quickly. And this also depends on the style uh, or the purpose that the individual draftsperson has uh, with their drawings. In particular, I... I like to create drawings that I can potentially transfer or use for future paintings. So with that block of graphite, it actually will uh, make the surface a little bit more rough for the, the hair since it's not really that sharp, the uh, block of graphite, which I'm okay with because, again, this drawing is, uh, it will serve kind of a utilitarian purpose in in the future as a, a way to study or a way to prepare for a future painting and as well as a transfer image for a future painting. But another interesting thing with the block of graphite, that's, an, that's a time where you can actually use a stump uh, without losing too much information, especially in the more flat areas such as the, uh, the darker shapes of the hair. And when drawing hair, uh, you, you really want to be very cautious with um, not over-exaggerating individual strands of hair, unless that's what you want to do. Very similar to painting, I chose individual areas of light in the hair and just let the mark of the, um, the hatch mark, sorry, the hatch mark of the, uh, the pencil kind of suggest the existence of individual strands of hair. Now you're seeing how useful that block of graphite is. See how much area I covered without doing too much work. So with graphite in particular, uh, to compare it again to charcoal, there's a lot more materials involved in it than charcoal depending on how you work with charcoal, but I'd prefer uh, the graphite for this type of study, this, t this uh, more, I guess, quote-unquote, finished study. And there you're seeing the stump. Just as I mentioned before, the stump and the block of graphite go together pretty well in the background. And though building the darks is, in fact, the last stage to this drawing process, all of these stages or steps before can be further developed. Uh, so that is the outside shape of the face, for instance, can be further developed. And so can the, uh, the accents and the accuracy of the light and shadow shapes. All of 
the previous stages can be further developed in this stage. And remember, it was my own decision to leave the lights of the face a little bit more compressed. So I didn't go too dark uh, with the lights on the face. Again, just because that's the particular uh, look that I wanted to get out of this drawing. And as mentioned before, with the hair, you want to simplify it into large areas of uh, kind of blocky shapes, planes, just like you would with a painting. But I do leave some areas uh, with hatch marks or pencil marks just for the own individual I don't know, aesthetic of the drawing. I don't want everything to be too perfect or too too smooth. Now we're even subtracting a little bit of light with the kneaded eraser, though I don't really recommend it as much. You can still subtract highlights in some areas. And you actually see this kind of um, practice in many academic drawings or academic portrait drawings where the face is very, very highly refined, um, but then the background is just flat and then the hair is just flat. Um, that's something you can do, but for my own aesthetic, I do like to have uh, planes in the hair. I like to treat the hair with the same kind of uh, three-dimensional thinking as the planes of the face, but with less information so that it, you know, it doesn't deter or distract too much. And there I'm using the stump to actually make the edge softer around the side of the hair. And now with a uh, very, very sharp, uh, that should be a 9B pencil, I'm going to start to very carefully now uh, vary the edge work around the contour of the face. And I highly recommend a mechanical or um, an electrical pencil sharpener so you can keep the pencils as sharp as possible. There you see, very quick transition there. Uh, just how dark the 9B graphite pencil can go. And I did uh, make it very, very dark. So what you wanna do with graphite when you wanna make something as dark as that is build your way up to the dark uh, instead of trying to go for that darkest value right away. So we're just layering a little bit of a darker area for the hair. Again, to put in a plain change for the side of the hair with the 9B pencil. And I highly recommend a uh, an electric sharpener, especially with the softer graphite. Um, I was using a regular mechanical sharpener for the 9B and the lead is so soft it kept breaking. So just a little technical, uh, little technical bit of advice there. And now with the drawing, the likeness might not be quite there just yet, which is okay because I do intend to use this for a transfer drawing, for a painting. And again, when you're trying to build your skill set in painting, in particular. Drawing is the best way to get there. Uh, I talked to many of you on um, Instagram and on Patreon. I always get asked the question, how to improve, how to improve. And the answer is almost always drawing, 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 and drawing. And as this video suggested, it's a very learnable process. 
again, you can continue to rewatch this video and you will see the patterns. You know, the big shape of the face, uh, outside shape, inside shape, refine the shapes, uh, mass in the shadows, the dark accents, continue to uh, build the darks, model the form, and repeat the process. It's a very predictable process, which is something that I like. Uh, with drawing and with time you can continue to build your skills and remember if you are currently in my portrait drawing class or plan on taking one of my portrait drawing classes in the future this is a supplemental video that follows the same type of steps that i have outlined for you in your class syllabus and remember to scroll down to the description box below to see uh, the class that I'm currently offering or the classes that I will be offering in the future linked again in the description box down below. That being said, I wish you the best in all of your artwork and I'll see you on the next episode.